Great. Nice to have you here. So, first, I'd like to turn to you, uh, Loyai. Uh, considering at these times, it feels like youth is sort of really at the forefront of these days. Uh, so you've been here throughout the summit, and, and I'd like to ask you to give the sort of a youth perspective um, around the issues that we discussed, and where are your thoughts today, given uh, the topics and your background? Hello. Okay, it's working. Uh, thank you for this great question. It's an uh, honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So when it comes to youth perspective on the issues on the health and food systems, um, I think we need a total transformation of the way we produce, process, uh, distribute, consume, and waste our food. Uh, world poverty is increasing, world hunger is increasing, we're having high population growth, and on top of that we have climate change that's disrupting the whole water, energy, and food network, causing more and more burdens to the farmers. And that's, as a result of that, we have high urbanization waves uh, all over the world. Uh, young people now don't want to work on agriculture. Agriculture, which is the cornerstone of um, human existence, is now looked down upon by young people as because it's always related with being poor, living in poor conditions, dealing with soil erosion, biodiversity loss, water scarcity, uh, disrupted rainfall patterns, and so on. We now have the largest world population uh, in history. 85% of them are living in developing countries where, where we, agriculture is mostly the main source of income. And if these young people don't want to work in agriculture and with the FAO, uh, FAO expecting that uh, we need to increase our food production by 60% by 2050, then we're facing an unprecedented challenge when it comes to food security. So it's clear that we need to change the way our system is working. And not only our food systems, our water, energy, food systems, all of that need to change. And young people who are the future have a huge role to play in that, and that's why governments and everyone need to empower them. Thank you. That's a really important point that has not, as far as I've heard at least, been up here, sort of the, the level of interest or the lack of, of interest in, in agricultural system, and I think it's similar here in Sweden, as I've heard. Uh, so, Stefan, being the chair of the advisory board of the summit and and been here and been also in the preparations of everything. Can you share with us any patterns or underlying structures that you see emerging or emerging in your perception from spending the days here immersed in the conversations? Thank you. I have a few mental notes and, and uh, possible takeaways. And, and one of them, I think, from yesterday is that three billion people in the world cannot afford a healthy diet. And that's quite fundamental. And then I add that to my previous recollection of our UNICEF report the other year, showing that two out of three children in the world don't get the food they need. Too little, too much, or the wrong kind of food. But then I think I'm also reminding myself that the cheapest food can actually make you fat. <laughs> and, and, and in many ways, in here, as well as in Africa, the cheap calories somehow uh, are not the healthy ones. So it's not necessarily underweight only. And, and in fact, uh, I think we heard uh, Namukolo discuss yesterday the double burden of malnutrition. The fact that you have stunted children who are too short for their age, but at the same time you have rising overweight and obesity rates in adolescents and adults. Uh, and, and that's of course bad on the nutrition side, but it also it reinforces the double disease burden. Because uh, Tzidi here, Dr. Mueti, has to contend with c continued infectious disease, maternal mortality, and then tackle the non-communicable disease crisis. And I think the dynamics there are actually very big, because in the research I did with my, I have my Makerere tie on here today, uh, we actually showed that in rural areas in Uganda, the diabetes prevalence in adults is double that of Sweden. And if you listen to Mina, who has spoken a lot about Kerala in India, it's four times Sweden. And this is now on an upward trajectory. And that dynamic is so forceful that it can actually overwhelm healthcare systems, if nothing else. Uh, so, coming back to, I, I think, what reflections on our summit here and how we need to go is that as we discuss this, I think we need to although we are in Sweden, we must remember that it's not just overnutrition, it's undernutrition and all forms of malnutrition. Uh, and Africa's challenge in many ways is much more complicated than we the one we have he here in Sweden. 
uh, particularly now that your urban population, which is landless, is for the first time rising so quickly. It used to be that everyone in Africa had land. That's no longer the case, right? And then you add the climate crisis and decreasing agricultural yield, displacement of people on top of that. So you have a busy job, Mweti. And for us, I think we need to globally reflect on this. But the hopeful note I see is that there's still room to prevent some of the mess that we are in, because you can still stifle some of the nutrition transition. People may have aspirations for hamburgers and uh, instant noodles and other things, but maybe you still have time to stop that. Uh, my final point is the one around trade. Uh, I, I really like this uh, accountability without borders. Uh, thank you, Sidi, uh, for that. Uh, because I, I think we cannot have double standards in what you can sell in the European Union and what you can export. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the European Union's global health policy uh, strategy, which will come next month. And I'm hoping that it will not just deal with a bit of aid, but that it will actually go straight into where the European Union is strong, regulating trade, for the reasons that Dr. Mwete laid out. And uh, I think that's something for you, Anders, and the Swedish presidency of the European Union to take up. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, turning to Anders, and for those who don't know, Anders is a medicinal doctor and a long-time diplomat in various um, positions. So, so, Anders, what trends are you seeing in the field of food system and health, sort of from the outside, because you haven't been uh, in here for two no. days. So. No, thank you very much. First, to, to respond to, to Stefan, just to say, I can promise you that there will be no recommendations about hamburgers in that strategy. Uh, but there will be quite a few other messages that will be very much, I think, in line with what your discussions here. And, and that is sort of what I'm hearing, seeing, picking up, was uh, relating to this, that we see some big mega trends in societies that you've been speaking about, we've been speaking about here. Food transition, but also energy transition, urbanization, demographic changes, all of those in some way man-made. And unfortunately, all of those then moving us in a direction of worse health for animals, for people, and for the planet. So I think this kind of discussions uh, is important in order, in order to reverse this trend, because the trends are taking us in the wrong direction now. So to collectively see how we can reverse those trends. Um, a figure that I got with me from, from a piece in The Lancet that was published last year, they looked at eight of the big countries in the world, 50% of the world's population, 70% of where greenhouse gases or uh, the emissions are coming from. They saw that if we would implement the Paris Agreement, from a public health perspective, we would save six, six million lives per year. And if you remember how many we have lost now from COVID, and if you think about how we have mobilized the world now for COVID, six million one year if we would implement the Paris Agreement. Six million we have now, basically, the whole world has just done one thing. So can we do that other thing instead? Uh, also, what I'm picking up in terms of way forward and trends, sort of where I think we need to move, three things. The first one is then to move from sectors to systems. And that is a bit difficult for us because we are organized. Science universities are organized according to disciplines. Veterinary medicine, human medicines, ecology, etc., etc. So it's difficult to take a systems perspective. Same thing for governments in terms of ministries. Uh, and the same thing for the international organizations. But the trend is saying we need to move beyond the sectors and work more in a systems approach. Uh, the second one is to talk about, and I'm hearing more, more about this, the co-benefits, but also the trade-offs. Can we maximize the co-benefits, but then we need also to talk about what are the positive and negative uh, trade-offs here. And the only way of doing that is to be clear about what we would like to achieve, what is really the goal. And the, we have very clear goals for our climate work. We're less clear about the goals for our health work. What is a single indicator here that corresponds to the two degrees on health. Uh, and also to be clear about what our ultimate impact that we would like to achieve and what our means to get there. 
A healthy diet for me, that's a means in order to achieve a final outcome. But we need to be clear about this logic and talk about the co-benefits and trade-off to become as effective as possible. And the final one, which has also very much been now debated during the COVID outbreak, is about the links or lack of link in between evidence and politics. And I think we need to have a better understanding of that there is a logic to politics. Even if we as technical people do not believe that, but there is a political logic and there is political science. And I think to find this more effective way of working between evidence and also activism and politics is another trend that I see that we are beginning to learn. And I think that's important for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm just a uh, heads up that we will invite uh, you also to pose questions. But first, I would like to turn to you again, Sidi. Uh, so the issue of power and relation, oh, sorry, the issue of power and leadership has come up here uh, during the summit as important levers for change. So could you reflect from WHO Africa perspective to where should more power be transferred, mm -hmm. and from whom would you ask for stronger leadership to reach the goal of health for both people and planet? Okay. Um, uh, if I can just pick up on a comment from Hans uh, from. from uh, I, um, Anders, I don't think we're not clear about health goals. Really? <laughs> I, think, I think we are clear about the health goals, but I guess the, the, the conversation here is how we progress in achieving good health and well-being all over the world with a strong emphasis on equity, and not just equity within countries and within societies, but equity across the world in the face of some of the issues that are being discussed here. So I, I think we are clear about where it is that uh, we'd like to go. Otherwise, I, I deserve to be sacked, to lose my job, <laughs> <laughs> at least from Africa. Um, I, I think to, to, to answer your question, so where should some of, where does the power lie? Where, where, should, it, where should it be? I mean, I, I think that uh, at the moment, what we see is an imbalance of power between the industries that drive some of the unhealthy foods and the communities that consume them. There needs to be a power balance between governments, the industry, and people as well, in my, in my view. So how do we mobilize and enable people's power? I, I think some of the discussions here, including how people can be informed um, and able to exercise what is good for them in multi multifaceted ways, both, uh, and, and I think the, the tobacco example really illustrated that if people are freed from certain ways of producing a product, and it could be, in this case it was tobacco, but it could be something else in farming, then it is good for their livelihoods, it's good for their families, and it is good for their health, as well as good for the health of those who consume this product, which is their neighbors and whoever else right up to the international level who, who, who is uh, sold this product. There needs clearly, I mean, a lot of power rests in governments. These are people who set the policy frameworks, the legislation that govern everything, in theory, that govern what gets done in agriculture, that governs what gets done in marketing, in regulation, in the rules, in taxation, and in people having the possibility and the ability to purchase and have access to in order to purchase food that is healthy. Because we know that in some contexts, depending on where you live, such food is just not available in your neighborhood and you have to spend more in order to find healthy food, which in itself costs mm. more. They, they have the power to tax these products so that they determine how the private sector invests or not or is able to market these products for countries. So I think their authority is, is uh, and their power is extensive. The power of the private sector is massive because they are able to influence at all levels. And again, this Kenyan example was they were able to influence pol politicians. We've seen them, uh, at least if I take the example of the tobacco industry, uh, influence through investment, support uh, for foundations of influential people, establish scientific institutions that provide scientific evidence that goes counter to all of this. So at, at the end of the day, I think the power really has to be with people, 
who decide I'm voting for you because you're doing this, that they need to be empowered and informed, and who address themselves as well as investors in some of these companies to persuade them to do what is good. I'll stop there, but I think the, the really power lies in different places, but very much among those who govern, regulate, legislate, mm -hmm. including of the private sector that, that is uh, invested in their countries. Thanks. Thank you. So, any comments to this? Sorry. <coughs> Sorry, the accountability <coughs> without borders implies domestically as well, then. Mm -hmm. But my question also is yes, you can hope for the regulators and all of that, but how can we empower the poor farmer to stand up for his or her rights without having to stick their neck out and get it chopped off? Uh, is there some innovation in? in how you can sort of digitally vote with your feet and be, let it be known that uh, accountability is not served? Or is it a legal redress? I've been quite encouraged. You, Anders, you mentioned three instruments, politics, business, and activism, but there is also law. Mm -hmm. uh, young people in the Netherlands and Germany have sued their governments for climate in, in activism. And in, in the Netherlands, young people sued successfully Shell a company. So who's going to sue a food company? Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, we can learn a lot from, from tobacco, what happened, research, changes of legislation, taxation, etc., but also people's values uh, in societies. No one is smoking here today, thank you very much. But we did 30 years ago, changes. Uh, and also how we've been interacting or not interacting with the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But food is much more difficult, and it's, there are even bigger powers there, of course, as you said. Yeah. But the question is, can we learn something from that, as you were saying, Stefan? I'm not sure that we sh could sue food industry in, that, in the same way. But um, to learn from how we combined, in some way, the instruments here in terms of legislation, research, resources, mm -hmm. but also the dynamics of communities and peoples and values, because mm -hmm. that was really what was also been driving why we are smoking less, at least in this country right now. Sure. Yeah. Good example. For me, if I may, people are also consumers of the products of these companies. Uh, people can be mobilized to, to, to not connect with this farmer and encourage him as well as act in places where what they buy makes a difference ultimately to the bottom <coughs> line of companies. People can be investors, yes or no, yep. in, in, in such companies and, and influence. And people are voters, ultimately. They can influence what happens with their governments as well. It's very difficult. I mean, I, I, I guess you, we need to talk about so the poor farmer. Uh, he can be empowered with knowledge, with support, and with, uh, in a way, uh, connection to other people. The, the farmer, too, eventually has his own vote in his low-income country, actually. So, so I think that also needs to happen. He is a parliamentarian. He is somebody who can influence the decisions that are taken in our countries as well. And I think we need to make people aware of that power and use the power that they have, because it does have an influence. And we've seen it have an influence in some countries around other policy decisions by legislators. I was thinking of extension services. Is that a function that is is controlled by government or business or others in terms of farm extension and support in sort of uh, choosing what crops to grow, choosing what in inputs to use? Yeah. Who's I, in charge? I mean, I, th th that's a very good question. Uh, and again, uh, I'll use uh, an, an industry that I know because sometimes farmers are being supported by the industry. But I mean, the government plays a role as well in providing support, knowledge, information, extension related support. It varies in different countries. So there again is, is the possibility for some influence and support mm. to people. Yeah. I mean, I, if again, I refer to the tobacco industry there, of course, there was a complete ownership of from A to Z by the industry of the inputs to the farmers, loans to the farmers who are indebted over years, the land on which they are farming. I mean, I, we hopefully, if we use that as an example, then we can find how to make the difference in other agricultural areas to uh, dent, if you like, this total authority and power that was an example there. Thank you. So now I invite <coughs> questions from the audience. And again, it's hard to see from here, but I think, yes, yeah, somewhere there in the back. 
Nice. Yeah, thank you for a very inspiring discussion. Um, and I wanted to come back to something uh, that some of you mentioned, but especially uh, Dr. Machidisu, you were talking about taxes also. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you could elaborate a bit. Uh, do you mean taxing unhealthy products? Because I think there's also another element of tax which was brought up a couple of years at the world ago at the World Economic Forum in Davos that large companies, including food companies, uh, should pay their fair share of tax. But the, the tax agreement decision was delayed, I think, recently again by a couple of years. So just wondering about your reflections and the role that could play in leveling the playing field, perhaps, between consumers in different countries and, and companies. Um, okay, that, I was actually referring to taxation of the product, of the food product, at the point of sale, so as to, in a sense, price it out of the interests of people to be able to buy it. Of course, that means there needs to be alternatives that are available that are healthier. So maybe it might go with subsidizing healthier food products where that's feasible. Uh, and that's been tried as far as alcohol is concerned and has triggered a very strong response by the alcohol uh, industry. I mean, I think we, we need to think about, so if you're taxing so that it's unaffordable, a particular food item which has been cheap and of which people have been buying in large quantities, as we see happening in cities in Africa, for example, the unhealthiest foods, people need to have an alternative. And what need, could that be? But that is one way which I've, we've seen has... Um, very strongly mobilized the alcohol industry, if I take it that way, because in some countries, if, if you take my own country, Botswana, the same wine that you buy in South Africa at a much cheaper price is quite costly in Botswana, and there was a very strong pushback by the alcohol industry, which meant that it actually was having an impact on their profits, etc. So this is something, that's what I was referring to. But if you're talking about taxation more broadly, perhaps that's something that could be explored as well. Yeah, Stefan. I think that, I, to my knowledge, there is a proposition on a 15% multi tax on companies to be applied across all countries. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that Sweden is helping in, in getting it implemented, and many countries are struggling, but uh, mm -hmm. so as to avoid sort of the race to the bottom between countries mm -hmm. uh, and moving profits around. But I know Anders had his hand up. No? Yeah, no, 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 no answer to this. We have a new government, so I'm not sure where we are on that. But um, no, but just say, I mean, there are some, another perspective on taxes, which is in some way more basic and quite straightforward, but still it's important to say that, I mean, first, yes, I mean, we have clear evidence that having taxation on certain products mm -hmm. actually have an impact. And we need to learn and we need to spread the knowledge about this and evaluate constantly to see that we get the right impact. Uh, but there's another dimension when it comes to the food industry because we need a private food industry. We can't have governments to produce food. That wouldn't be a good idea. And we need also to allow and to accept that industry is making money, that they're making profit. But they should make profit on something that is good for animals, for people's and planet's health. Okay. And and that's my message here, they, then should they also pay tax? And we have a big issue in the world today that there are many companies that are not paying tax, mm -hmm. and there are many governments who do not have sort of the, what I would call the right level of taxation. In Sweden, we have a very high level, we all of know that, but there are quite a few countries where there is also space actually to increase the amount of tax that the government is collecting. And why is that important? That is important then to invest in some of the public functions, education, uh, potentially supporting farming, but of course then health and health care. So taxation is important, mm -hmm. but it's also important that we have a vibrant private sector that are producing the right things, but that they're also paying tax. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question, if there is one. Hello, um, I'm Gloria. I uh, work with Africa Gripena on food and land rights. Um, thank you very much for your presentation um, from WHO. It was really good to listen to and I was really inspired on the alternative livelihood that initiatives that you talked about. Um, I just want to respond because there was one um, question from the 
first presenter on the other side, um, talking about who is actually going to sue these food companies. Mm. And you gave example from different countries, what they're doing in other initiatives. I would like to um, raise that um, communities within Sub-Saharan Africa are actually suing different companies mm. when it comes to human rights violation. But the suing comes in different entity. One example is actually how, for example, the wine campaign in South Africa, and that was also in collaboration with um, communities from Sweden as well, saying no to wine that support human rights violation. So there is that initiative. There's also campaigns when it comes to like seed rights. A lot of companies have been lobbying to have a regulation that actually regulates seeds within sub-Saharan Africa. And these regulations are good, but in details, they tend to favor company and exclude indigenous communities' seeds. Mm. So that already has an impact in the nutrition. And then also I wanted to highlight when it comes to AP funds in Sweden. There are AP funds that are invested in human rights violation in Mozambique. So one of the things that communities within Mozambique are doing is actually campaigning against that, that is causing a lot of stress. So there is a lot of initiatives when it comes to suing food companies, but there is not enough collaboration and solidarity in terms of funds, mm. in terms of research, backing up these kind of movements that is very vivid in the Western. So we all today have to try to, in our different roles, to actually support these movements, whether it's with research, whether it's going on the table, whether it's questioning our funds, how are used, and this will have a huge impact. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any reflections or comments on that? Otherwise you know, I've, <laughs> I've done something fun over the last two years. I've given seminars with the law students down the hill next to Stockholm's Nation, where we were last night. And I challenged them to actually figure out how, what they can do to better the world as law students. And I must say, I think we have something to do. I saw the vice chancellor here to inspire the law students here really to become legal activists and do what you're asking for. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there are some lessons to take home. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I will actually uh, save uh, my last question to you, Loa, but I, I, so I will invite um, the other ones for a short final word. So what do you see is the next important step for healthy food for a, from a healthy planet? And Anders, you're invited to start. A little bit building on the human rights, but another perspective on that. Those, that has to do with inequities in societies, different socio-economic groups, different opportunities. I'm speaking from a health perspective, we see this, this explosion of what we call non-communal diseases, cancer, cardiovascular diseases. Most people think that these are diseases for rich people. They are not. Those are affecting poor people most. Poor people and the lower socioeconomic groups are most at risk when it comes to food and when it comes to other risk factors. And to, for us to have more um, deliberate uh, strategies to both to visualize that this has to do with poverty and inequity and also finding ways of closing the gaps that I think is extremely important and for me in some way that's a human rights question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Stefan this is your final word. Thank you. Welcome. I, I would like all of us to stop saying lifestyle and making choices because for most people it's life condition mm -hmm. and the choices are made for us. And it's up to us to make those conditions conducive to healthy people and healthy planet. Mm, that was a very concrete thing. I'm mm. going to try to remember that because I say that often. Thank you. <laughs> Sidi, what would be your last reflection? Uh, yes, thank you. I, I, I very strongly agree with you. I, I think one of the things we saw from both tobacco and, and alcohol was talking about responsible drinking, making this very much an individual responsibility. So I think that that's, that's something that I, I very strongly support. Just inspired by the, the, the young lady there, I mean, I, I think that the kind of coalitions across different organizations and the sectors that we've talked about here really deserve to be supported and to be made to function and to be expanded. So that would be my takeaway. And in that said in, in terms of who can influence, who can have in solidarity support some of the indigenous within Africa, you're saying um, actions by communities to push back on this. I, I would say that 
you know, we have young people. I, I have a lot of hope in young people, people like you, who have strong opinions, who have bought into this agenda, who, who, who but young people really believe in dealing with climate change. We've seen them screaming at leaders in, 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 in conferences and saying, you're really not doing enough. There are lots of young billionaires all over the world today who've had a startup and made money. I believe our cause could mobilize young people globally and get them connected to other people in other countries, including some of the work that you are doing, and provide some of the support that's needed and in, in, perhaps inspire or shame some of us as well into playing more of our roles. So, now, I, I really think there's a lot of hope in the actions, the views of young people, and we need to mobilize it and work with it. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, last word from you, Loa. So what are your expectations on your government? Loa is from Egypt and the world as we gather in Sharm el-Sheikh for the COP27 in less than two weeks. Well, uh, it's now almost 2030 and we can say that we're significantly off track when it comes to achieving the Paris Agreement targets. Uh, we're clearly running out of time and uh, we can see that the world is still divided by uh, wars, pandemics, crisis, inflation and many other problems. We can see that we need, strongly need our governments to issue strong policies and not only policies, we need these policies to be translated into actions and projects on the ground that actually has impact on the people and the impact on the climate. So we definitely need our governments to unite together and work together into solving this climate crisis. And when it comes to young people, we need like mainly three things. We need from our governments access to proper education uh, opportunities. We need them to invest in young people and empower them. And we need them to engage with young people and make them part of the decision table. And the responsibility of a, a climate crisis does not fall on governments as well. Young people have a role to play. Uh, young people in the end are the ones who are going to inherit this planet. It's our generation and the future generations that are going to have to deal with all these problems. So to the young people, I tell them, like, we're the ones who are going to deal with this. So stand up, speak up, take action, because it's our problem in the end. Thank you. Thank you. And that is our closing. So thank you very much for your um, insights and sharings. And uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.